Hi, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to an evening with an albatross. Uh, my name is Lynn Adams. I'm with the Pacific Beach Coalition, and um, we are very proud to bring this program to you. Um, we, um, it's always our mission. Well, let me just read our mission. Uh, the Pacific Beach Coalition, Pacific Beach Coalition, is dedicated to preserving the ocean, coastal habitat, and wildlife, and ending litter through advocacy, education, community building, and citizen action. So um, while everything is a little crazy right now, with all that's going on in the planet, we still aspire to educate, engage, and inspire everyone to pick up litter so that they can join our team aiming to end litter. Our mission isn't just to pick up litter, it's to end litter. And in that regard, um, we, we work very hard and we got stopped from our big cleanups. We used to have you know 90 people uh, at a cleanup and we can't do that anymore. So we've been reaching other ways to get people to do the right thing and to pick up litter um, because it does, the litter doesn't stop. And in fact, it's probably increased. So uh, before we begin, I just wanted to say, I, I actually recognize some names on here and I see some people that are, I think from Wisconsin and Michigan and Hawaii. Um, are there other people that are online? Um, that would be really awesome. Uh, if you're from a different state representing other than California, um, which I, I, I assume probably most of us are from, uh, with, uh, from California. But if you're from another state, go ahead and put it in the comments. Um, you're welcome to put anything in the chat, you know, comment, uh, questions in the chat. There's also a question button. I'll be reviewing those periodically and trying to uh, get those questions to our speaker. So um, I just wanted to thank you. Um, please be nice in the chats. Um, if you have good comments, if you, you know, are inspired by something, feel free to write about it. Uh, we look forward to um, having fun with you today. So at this time, I would like to um, introduce to you, well, actually, someone said, why albatross? Why are we honoring albatross? Why are we, uh, why do we care? Or what, why do we choose the albatross? And it's a long process for the Pacific Beach Coalition to come up with an honoree for the year. And that honoree um, is something that really brings our message to the general public and to us. And so um, we chose the, uh, the albatross because they're great ambassadors um, for conservation. And they really share our, our, our most urgent messages right now about plastic in the ocean, plastic on the planet, and, um, and climate change and sea level rise. And both of those big ticket items really affect um, albatross. So that's how we chose the albatross and we're really proud to honor it. And we will honor them this year. We will honor them again next year. And if you would have come to Earth Day, if we could have done Earth Day, you would have seen um, our Earth Day was honoring albatross. But we'll get a chance to do that again next year. So I'm, enough from me. I'm proud to introduce um, to you a person that I met at an albatross talk in Marin. Um, I fell in love with her presentation. I fell in love with her talk and her art. Um, I recruited her to um, teach our school assemblies, and she was going to lead a lead an organization. She created that um, that video as a part of the um, Albatross assemblies that we were going to bring to students. She even has a traveling exhibit that's rented out through um, Exhibit Envoy, and uh, we we're able to hire that, that exhibit to go to all the schools here in Pacifica and to go to two libraries, Pacifica and Happen Bay. Uh, unfortunately, it was canceled because of COVID, but two schools got to see it. And we're gonna bring them back next year. So um, please welcome uh, an amazing artist, an author, a lover of albatross, Karen LaBelle Free. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Karen. Everybody. I'm in Volcano, Hawaii, so now we're really spread across <laughs> across the planet, pretty much, at least half of the planet. But I wanted to thank Pacific Beach Coalition so much. I'm delighted to be partnering with you guys, and I'm so excited to bring my love of albatross with, with you. And I want to thank everybody who's here today 
Thank you so much. I mean, I'm shout out to New York, New Jersey, Boston, <laughs> because I know some of you guys are here as well, and it's pretty late by you. But thanks so much for your interest and your support, everybody. And uh, we've already gotten some great questions. If anybody has questions, go ahead and put them in, ask a question, and we'll get to them over the course of our talk. And uh, we also have, I don't know, so if you are interested, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if you um, got a chance to see the video, then I don't want to be too repetitive. So you, you can let me know on the, in the um, chat area, or we can just, um, you'll, you'll enjoy watching. Who doesn't enjoy watching Albatross videos over and over again? I know I don't. <laughs> They're wonderful. They are wonderful. So we might, we're going to try to share some videos with you, but if it doesn't work out, then please, um, I encourage you to watch the video after if you haven't seen it already, because it gives a lot of information and the videos are all there plus more. So anyway, thanks for the opportunity to share with you guys. Yeah. So Karen, can I ask you a question? Um, so, so I understand that you uh, spent two seasons on Midway Atoll studying mm -hmm. the uh, albatross. How, how did you get interested in albatross in the first place? And, and, and how did your journey start with albatross? Well, first of all, when I was there, my main reason was as a volunteer uh, albatross counter, we call it. I was doing an uh, albatross census. So we basically counted all of the active nests on Midway Atoll. And um, what happened was, I'm not, I don't remember exactly what happened, why I became aware of albatrosses, but once I did, it was like just getting hit with a big, um, <laughs> something I could never ignore. So I started to learn everything I could about them. And I uh, started to really bug biologists and conservationists that I know and say, how can I get to Midway? So the way I got there was by becoming a, a um, I volunteered with the group of counters. And I was also researching. I, I ended up connecting with US Fish and Wildlife Service. They are actually managing Midway and they basically care for all of the wildlife there. Besides albatross, there's all kinds of amazing wildlife out on Midway. And um, it's it. I was researching for art that I created for Midway Atoll. So I don't know if you can see, but there's a, um, I have the poster that I did for Midway and they're actually friends of Midway is always raising funds for the care of albatrosses. So I'll tell you more about that later. But that's, that's sorry. awesome. What, what, what do you love most about the albatross? Wow, what do I love most about albatross? What don't I love about albatross? They're, they're wonderful, as you said before, Lynn, they're really amazing ambassadors because I feel like most people who see them just um, engage with them because they're, there's something familiar about them because they're, they're, um, they mate for life. So they're, they're really into each other. Uh, but interestingly, when they go off, they come together only when they're nesting on Midway once a year. But other than that, they both, the, um, the couple, the two up from the couple go off by themselves. They don't see each other all the rest of the season. So it's kind of an interesting plan for a relationship. <laughs> wow. Um, so um, how many different kinds of albatross are there? The, the ones that your artwork is, is mostly the albat the lace on albatross. Is That's that correct? correct? Yep. So, so, so how, many, how many species are there? And can you tell me a little bit about the general population? Sure. So um, there are 22 recognized species right now of albatross. We only see three in the Northern hemisphere and the rest are in the Southern hemisphere. And there are actually, there are some much larger ones south of the equator. And like here, the albatrosses, like the Laysan albatrosses, they have like a six, seven foot wingspan. Um, but there's also the black-footed albatross and the short-tailed al albatross, and they're all north of the equator. Southern albatrosses, some of them have up to an 11 foot wingspan. So they're, they're like the giants of albatrosses, but it's kind of interesting. So they don't cross the equator. And that's because they're, the story of an albatross is, wind without wind they they can't survive they have adapted to use wind to be able to travel huge distances to get to food sources 
And the reason why they go all the way back to islands in um, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which is called Papaha no Moku Akea in Hawaiian, they, they go to these islands that used to be uh, free of predators. So that was a safe place for them to nest because they nest on the ground. So they're very, very susceptible to predators just being able to attack them. Um, so they, they have to be able to travel really far distances. So it's just amazing how they've used, they've learned and adapted to use wind to be able to go effortlessly through the air. It actually takes more effort to walk on land than it does to, for them to fly like a thousand miles at a clip. So how can they fly a thousand miles? How well, <laughs> they actually do a couple of different things. They do dynamic soaring, which is, so dynamic soaring and slope soaring. So they use wind, which is rising over the wave fronts. And they also use, use ocean swells, which provides lift for them. So they can actually go like up to 50 miles an hour and to watch them, I got to watch them on Midway. Um, we went outside of the reef in a boat and I got to see them doing their thing, but you can even see them close to shore. Actually, you can see them offshore in California, but they basically have spread their wings out and they go side to side, up and down, and they just continue to do that using the, the energy from wind and um, from the wind off of the ocean. Well, I think we have a video about flying. If um, Hardy, if it's possible to queue up uh, the the flying video, it's number four. And if the video doesn't work, you, you guys can also see it on um, on the presentation, the video on YouTube. So you're welcome to see that. Oh, I think here we go. There it is. Just has to be bigger. Okay, Mart. Uh, Hardy, can you make that bigger by chance? Thanks for your patience, everybody. <laughs> Let's see what kind of questions we have. Maybe in the meantime, I'll. I'll um... So Let here's a that. here's an interesting question. So, do albatross ever foster chicks that are abandoned? Um, I don't think they would. I think they would definitely foster an egg. If you put an egg underneath them, they would they would definitely continue to incubate that egg. And then once the the egg it, the chick pecks its way out, then the the parents would care for that chick. But once once they have their chick and they and they're bonded with that chick, I've never heard. I mean, the way they act with chicks around, I don't think that they would be. But I can I can verify that, but that would be my sense because I saw them being pretty much into their, only into their chicks. Oh, I think we have the video now. Oh, good, let's see if that works. There we go. Okay, so you can see that albatross, it's kind of small. There, see, it goes to the side and then to the side and they even touch the, they touch the water with the tip of their wing when they go down close to the water. And they just keep on doing that same movement up and down, back and forth, side to side. And it's it's incredible, incredible to watch. So um, uh, I'm just looking at the questions here. What was your happiest and saddest memory about being on Midway Atoll hmm. for seven weeks? Well, I was there two times, and uh, the first time I went was pretty amazing because I was um, looking forward to going, and I had learned so much about them. So I have to say, it's interesting. When you go to Midway, you actually fly out at night because albatrosses are most active during the day, and that's the safest time to land without having a strike. Um, so when we did come in, it was it was very late at night. It was completely dark, and as we we landed and we but we went down the runway and I realized that caught in the beam of light, all these white bodies and they were all albatrosses. I mean, we ended up counting um, over 600,000 
nesting what? albatrosses when I was there the first time. That was actually a record count that that was um, in 2015. It was amazing. It was a huge, huge year for um, nesting albatrosses then. So that was, I mean, I have so many happy times. I think my saddest moment, I mean, there's a couple of sad moments. When you see death, of course, it makes it makes you feel really sad. Um, and also leaving. My, <laughs> my heart was just being ripped out of my body when I had to leave. And it was such an interesting feeling because on one hand, I felt like it was, it meant so much to me. And then, but realizing that this wildlife, it, it has, it existed way before humans even existed. I mean, albatrosses have been around for millions of years and we humans, I mean, it hasn't been that long, relatively speaking. And um, so to them, it's like, it doesn't, I don't make any difference to them. And that was a very interesting feeling for me personally. And I really liked it. Oh. Uh, wow. Um, someone asked, when is the albatross breeding season and what is their diet? Okay, so they breed um, in the winter. I mean, they when we when I arrived there, it was uh, December, mid December. So they arrived in November, and that's when they start getting ready to get down to business. So you have a couple of different things going on. You have the adults that are mated. Mated pairs arrive within like a day of each other usually, but they just, it's incredible. It's like so synchronized. They come back from being out at sea. And they land and they and usually the um, two mated adults that have been at this for a long time, they they will get right down to business and and um, and lay their egg. But you also have albatrosses that are younger that are coming back sometimes for the first time, because when al after albatrosses fledge, they go out to sea for like four years or more. And they then they start to come back and they come and they meet each other. So you see tons of dancing. And dancing is the way they court. That's the way they get to know each other. Because through dancing, they actually can judge each other's fitness. And they can kind of, they can gauge age and experience by how well they dance. So it's, that's really cool. Oh, and here's another thing that I just loved. One time when I was um, just on Midway and just watching them coming in. So I saw this young albatross. And I say young because it just seemed like it. I don't, I, you can't determine it. Albatrosses age because they look the same, but whether they're young or old, I mean, be it when they once they reach adulthood. So this albatross was coming down, and I'm watching, and she was already dancing before she even touched the ground. She oh. was first. She, there was an albatross that was down there that was dancing, and she they touched bills as she was landing, and as her feet were touching, she was already dancing. So it was like she was so excited to be coming back. I'm calling her a she just because you can't tell the difference between the sexes. I mean, some people um, believe that they can, but they look very much alike. Oh, and one other really cool thing. I know I, I went pretty far from the answering that question. Okay, what do they eat? So they their favorite food is squid. And they also eat flying fish eggs. And later on, let's, let's talk about flying fish eggs again, because that ties into why they eat so much plastic. But I don't want to get into that right now. Okay, is that okay, Lynn? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. So anyway, that's basically what their diet is. They land on the surface of the ocean and they sit on the surface and they move their little feet around and then they grab, they grab uh, usually squid from the ocean, but that they're called surface feeders because they, they, they eat from the surface of the ocean. Don't they create biolu bioluminescence? Yes, this is so cool. So I was trying to, I, I had all these questions, of course, and every time you have a question answer, then more questions come up. But um, there was one biologist that helped me by bringing to my attention research that has been done about, well, how do albatrosses catch their prey? Because it's not like squids are saying, hey, here I am, come and get me. But they actually have, a, albatrosses have an incredible sense of smell and they can sense their prey that way. And they actually, what, they're, what is, what is um, thought to be the way that they actually lure prey is by moving their, paddling their feet under the water and it attracts the um, bioluminescent creatures or moves them around and lights them up. And the squids eat them and then the albatrosses grab the squid. Isn't that cool? I just love that. That is just such a, ah, it's so cool so to think of them fishing that way. 
That's amazing. It's really remarkable and uh, that they can go in the vast ocean and fly thousands of miles to find that food. Mm -hmm. so, but I want to go back. Um, if it's all right with you, I'd like to try to play that courtship video that you have. Oh, sure. And then dancing. we can talk about the dancing. dancing. Great. Okay. Great. And then I, I, I do think we should we should still go back and see the curious albatross. How about oh, yeah. if we if we do those in succession? Okay. That sounds great. So curious is such a fun thing because I'll, I'll tell you about that one afterwards. But remember to ask me, Lynn. <laughs> okay. So let's do the courtship and then we'll go curious. curious. Here's curious. So, oh, here's the, curious. Okay. Yeah. So I was standing with my camera, and this albatross was coming over to me, like, "What? What are you? And what's that thing?" And was just so gently, kind of checking me out. Oh. <laughs> and the thing about albatrosses. So this this guy. He was, this is the third time he came up to me, and he kept on pulling at the cord of my camera. Probably reminded him of a squid, I don't know. But anyway, he was practically ripping the camera from my hands. He was very strong and extremely persistent. He wouldn't have stopped, I, I stopped. <laughs> wow. And the thing about albatross is they, are, they probably have never seen, a hum, most albatrosses have never seen a human before. So that's another amazing thing for a human to experience is these creatures that they're just used to being in a place where there are no predators and we are a predator and we bring, we brought all the predators to them. So, and what that's predators, part of, What yeah. predators do, do they have on the island? Well, for, for a long time, rats are a big problem. Uh, right now, mice are a huge problem and actually on Midway and actually in, in other islands like Gough and Southern, in the South, they have a terrible problem with mice and they're gonna be doing an eradication program because what mice do is they, I think it has to do with drought, has something to do with them. They change their behavior and they don't always do this, but some years they uh, start to um, prey on the alb nesting albatrosses. So they actually climb up and um, they, you can see blood on their heads. They, they climb all the way up. And actually they put a, when they started, people, researchers out there started to see this, these injuries on albatrosses. And it was just very mysterious, like why, what is this? What's causing this? And they put a night vision camera on it and then they saw it and it was just like, oh my gosh, mice. I mean, these little cute house mice, house mice. Oh. So we, it's because of us, we, we brought house mice there. So wow. that's why we, and you know, and there's other things like interesting, you wouldn't think like a, a plant would be like such a threat to albatross, but there, there was a, a, a huge problem with this plant called Verbicina on Midway. And, and it's, they're still, they're, they'll probably never totally eradicate it. But what happened was it, it was basically taking over all of their nesting area. And Midway is where most of the world's uh, Laysan and black-footed albatross nest. So without this, this, this island or this atoll, it's, um, they're in trouble. They need to have a place on land to nest. So um, that they've been working on eradicating the um, verbicina, and it's these they the verbicina has seeds that just last forever. They're indestructible. Years later, they're blooming up, blooming again. But they're done wow. really well. They've done really well, and now it's ironwood. So they're starting to get rid of areas with ironwood. But humans wow. are taking care of it. You know, I mean, I feel I, I'm so grateful to Fish and Wildlife and everybody that works out on Midway because they're really. Um, they're really working on it. And that, that's actually the albatrosses nest on some of the other uh, Northwestern Hawaiian islands as well. Okay. I have a, I have a question here. Um, and while I, while, while you answer this question, Hardy, can you get ready to play the courtship video so we can see them? I think that's just too cute. So the courtship video. Um, so Karen, um, Lily wants to know when is the albatross breeding season? And what is their diet? So you talked about their diet already, but what is their when is their breeding season? Well, I I started to talk about that. So so they begin in um, they arrive like in um, November, and then they they get right to business. So then um, the chicks pretty much into the summer. So all of that time that that covers the cycle of um, porting, laying the egg, and then the, once the then it's incubating the egg, and then the uh, 
then the parents go to work at feeding the egg one at a time. So both parents are involved in taking care of the egg and the chick. It's it's a really incredible cooperation. Wow. So let's watch the, the courtship video, the uh, dancing video, and then we'll pick it up. Oh, it looks like it's pixelated. I'm not seeing it very well. So you guys are going to have to um, watch it. Oh, my gosh. I really encourage you to watch the video. It doesn't look like it's coming through that clearly, unfortunately. But so tell, tell, me, tell me a little yeah. bit about this. They, they have moves, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They've got moves. <laughs> They're incredible moves. And, and they have vocalizations that are all, I mean, it's very worked out. And each species of albatross has their own. I mean, I spent the most time with Laysan and black-footed albatrosses, and they have completely different dances and songs. Completely different. So it's, it's really interesting. Wow. Oh, it's such a repertoire. You can't even believe it. It's very cool. And they're like, they're, they, they really watch each other. That's, they really gauge each other's um, abilities. And it's also cool to see the young ones. Okay, so this is the black-footed. There you go. Unfortunately, you can't hear it, but you can see it. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> I wish you could hear it, too. Oh my God, look at all the albatross out there. Is that on the oh, Midway Atoll too? Oh yeah, there we go. You can hear them. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, it's amazing. And they're very synchronized. I mean, when you watch them dance, it's so much about them dancing with each other. And it so, looks kind of, I mean, it's sort of entertaining to watch them, but I have to tell you, it's serious business for them. They mate for life. So they, if they're judging each other, mostly by dancing, then it's pretty, it's very serious to them. So you really start to see it differently when you realize how important that is for them. That's amazing. Um, I did have a question here about um, if they mate for life, and uh, can you tell us about wisdom? And mm -hmm. the question is, what about her partner? Yeah. Wisdom's partner. Would it be the same partner all this time? Well, she's had a few partners, and what happens is they mate for life or until one mate, if, if one mate doesn't show up, then they usually um, wait around and then they'll go back out to sea and they'll, they'll come back and they'll start to prospect the year after that. So Wisdom has already had a few, at least three mates. I'm not sure how many more. There's probably people out there um, at this, watching this right now that know. And if you know, please put it in the, uh, in the chat. How many, how many mates has Wisdom had? Or you could probably Google it. <laughs> but it's been a few. And it's incredible because so in 1956, Tr Chandler Robbins put a a band on wisdom. And because of that, we we were able, we meaning the people were able to gauge how old she is. So she continues to come back. We know for a fact that she's at least 69 years old and she's been coming back every year and laying an egg. She's had many successful um, chicks since then. But she, um, I mean, you wouldn't know it to look at her that she's 69 she's still having babies. Can you imagine? Wow. <laughs> wow. 69? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, somebody wrote, I love the Albatross video. Great. Thank you. That's nice. Um, do they nest? Do yeah. they, the, the, the question is, do they nest on other islands? They do. They do. They nest a, on other um, Northwestern Hawaiian islands. They also nest on some of the main Hawaiian islands. They're on um, at Kaena on um, Oahu and also at Kilauea Point. And that's a pretty cool place to go see albatross because they're, they are, you can see them there. If you go up to Kilauea Point on Kauai, you can see albatrosses. You can see them on people's lawns there. If you watch the video, you'll see, I show actually a sign, albatross crossing, and it's not a joke. You really do have to be careful about not hitting them. Another really cool story is on um, Pacific Rim Coalition, Pacific Rim Conservation, sorry. they. Um, they are translocating albatrosses because they want to create safe 
places, they're kind of like an island within an island. So they've they've built a predator-proof fence around a big area, and now they're it's on different islands. But within that predator-proof fencing, now they've brought alb young albatrosses and they raise them, they feed them. I volunteer with them when I can, and it's just it's incredible to see how they are figuring out how to um, ca really care for albatrosses. And then the hope is, of course, that they bond with this new place and that they'll come back to this place when they when they fledge. You know, it will, it's going to be four or five years before you know whether they survived and whether they're going to come back there to to um, breed. And already they're having returns, repeat customers. <laughs> so it's like, yay, very exciting. Yeah, maybe you can tell them about how they choose their place where they where they nest and um, oh. how they return. Mm -hmm. And why why they why they're concerned about all the albatross being on the Midway Atoll? Well, they do. They end up. They they always return to the place where they um were where where they fledged from. So it's it's get it's very crowded on Midway, and there and there are actually prospectors that go. I mean, I know that um some an island a couple of islands off of Mexico. There's uh there are some albatrosses breeding there. And actually when you see the albatrosses off the California coast, those actually usually come from um, the islands off of Mexico. But yeah, they return to the place where they fledged from. So what was the other part of your question? Um, what's the problem with all of the albatross being on the Midway Atoll? Why is there a challenge there? Well, there's a lot of challenges for albatrosses, um, but it, it, it is getting crowded there. And um, there's also, uh, when you're out there, it's sort of shocking. I mean, it's this beautiful, pristine place and the amount of garbage that washes up on the beach. We, we did beach cleanups. I mean, you clean up everything and it continues to come in. So it's an incredible indicator of the amount of plastic and trash that we put into the ocean, it's uh, it's shocking. So anyway, that's why I, I love working with um, you guys, Pacific Beach Coalition, because you really get the word out about how we really have to stop using single-use plastic and just be really conscious of our plastic use because mm. it's really in there. And that's another cool thing about albatross and why it's important to study them. And that is because they're great indicators of the health of the ocean, because unfortunately, so I was saying before what they eat. So they eat mostly squid, but they also eat flying fish eggs. So the way flying fish are, they lay their eggs on things that are floating on the surface of the ocean. And it used to be things like pumice, a volcanic, a light volcanic substance, and also um, wood, little pieces of wood. But now there's plastic. So it's actually created an incredible opportunity for flying fish, which was brought to my attention by Beth Flint, who's a US Fish and Wildlife uh, biologist. But she said that they, the flying fish now have incredible opportunity for laying a lot of their eggs on plastic. So what albatrosses do is they go out, they eat the uh, flying fish eggs and they also consume the plastic that they're attached to. Then they'll bring the, the food back and feed their chicks. So sometimes albatrosses um, are just, they're, they're become, they don't have any room for real food and they either die from die, die from dehydration or from starvation. And you can actually sometimes see them. I'm sorry for people that are squeamish, but you can actually see the, um, the carcass of a fish, a, a bird, sorry, an albatross that, and you see the stomach and it has a ton, it's just full of plastic. Yeah. So that makes you really not want to <laughs> pollute when you see what the what plastic does to these chicks and it's so out of our sight i mean us humans we we don't know that how we're affecting the ocean by the what we inadvertently put into it um i hate to go back but 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 i do have a good question how many times would they pair off dancing evaluation before choosing the mate for life Oh, that's a great question. I have no that's from idea. Chris Romero. Hi, Chris. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it seems like from just my lay observation that they spend a lot of time 
a lot of time sort of gauging each other and dancing with a lot of different partners. And you can see, I mean, you see one, I'm going to call it a guy because I don't know. You see one guy and he's just like, oh, he wants so badly to uh, meet the right person. And he's dancing his heart out. And she kind of comes up and she'll dance a little bit. And and then it's like, yeah, and she turns away and walks off to another group. And they'll, and they'll dance in groups. Like sometimes you'll see three or four that are dancing together in the circle. And it's just, oh, it's so cute. It's so cool. If it's all right with you, I'm going to ask you all these mating questions because there's a bunch of questions sure. about the mating. So, uh, do the during, their, during their mating dance, why do they tuck their beaks under their wings? Right. Well, why do we go like this when we dance? I mean, it's just <laughs> one of those things that albatrosses do. <laughs> and all the species have a different dance. So who knows? I mean, who knows who invented these special moves and what do they mean? It's it's a mystery. And <laughs> um, so how do they learn those dances? Oh, I love that question because it's a trip to watch that they, I mean, I've heard, I haven't actually seen this happen. They it's almost like they're born <laughs> dancing. It's like it's part of them because they, um, their parents don't teach them. They observe others around them. So they're growing up, they're these little little chicks and, they, and they're watching. I mean, everybody around them is dancing. So they probably learn a lot from observing, but still it's this, it's part of them. It's really interesting. So um, I heard that some of those chicks that are, relocated to a new island right mm -hmm. in the attempt of getting them more diverse places mm -hmm. i heard that they didn't even have a parent to watch and they know how to dance is that true right that's exactly right lynn yep yep and that's something that's just so wild wow. but they how did they learn i mean they probably had some exposure before they were translocated but yeah it's pretty incredible uh, Tom Soleil wants to know, what does a baby albatross look like? <laughs> they looks so cute. <laughs> well, different albatrosses look different. Like their, their baby plumage is um, a different color, but the Laysan have, have um, dark brown plumage they're, when they're um, born and growing up. And then when they start to lose it, if, you'll, if you watch that, uh, the video that I put together, I actually show some pictures during that awkward stage when they start to lose their their baby down dark feathers and then their their white adult feathers are visible between and they they kind of lose them and they have mohawks left and you know they it's always very they look funny during that I stage. I think you, you need don't to show us your albatross them. doll. What about your albatross doll? Oh, okay. So I have a couple of different albatross plushies. And um, maybe, we can now, maybe we can cue up the video um, uh, about talking to their egg while we're on this subject. Sure. So a friend of mine makes these wonderful um, plushies and you can find them online. I, let me see. I even have the uh, email address. Anyway, look up albatross plushies, but they um, that's a much younger one. And here's an older one. That's a sweetie, too. <laughs> wow. So, so Hardy, can we can we play the one uh, talking to their eggs? So I should say, as okay, Hardy has this already. Great. So let me just say, albatross only lay one egg per season. So it's one egg. So they devote so much energy. I mean, it takes a lot of energy to produce this heavy, big egg. But then after this egg is laid, just watch how these parents are so attentive to this egg. And listen to them. But you could hear them. It's just so cute. Aww. Thanks, Hardy. So so well there we go. Karen, what does it take to raise a chick? How long does it take? And um oh. tell us about tell us about the cycle. Okay. So
I wrote this all down because it's all, I always forget the exact times. So they, um, once they lay the egg, they incubate for about, about 65 days. What? So they're Too actually, much? so, so the parents are taking turns and they can stay on the, just sitting there for up to three weeks, two to three weeks. So one, one of the parents sits on the egg incubating and then the other one goes out to sea and then comes back. So that's actually kind of amazing how close to starvation and dehydration they must get to be sitting there for that long. They don't leave the egg. They don't, they have such fidelity to that egg and that nest site that they actually just stay put. So um, then about, um, so after about 65 days, the chick starts to hatch, starts to peck its way out of the egg and the parents encourage like with vocalizations, but they don't do anything to help. The chick has to get out on his or her own. And then um, once they hatch, then the parents again, stay on and keep the chick warm until the chick is actually able to um, stay warm on its own, like regulate its own body temperature. But they then continue, continue to take turns after that, coming back and feeding the chick. So both parents leave once the chick can maintain its body temperature. So then they start to come back, both adults come back regularly to feed the chick until the chick is big. And um, that's about, about 165 days later, parents stop returning because the chick is, is big and they stuff it with food. And then they say, okay, kid, <laughs> you're on your own. And then it's up to the, uh, the young albatross, the juvenile to just get hungry enough and thirsty enough to be driven out to sea. And I should point out albatross is really their, their true home is over the ocean and they spend most of their lives over the open ocean. So this time that, I got to see them. I mean, that nesting, that breeding time is, it's a, like 10%, not even 10% of their lives. So it's pretty interesting. That's their home. Their home is the ocean. That's why they're called seabirds. They actually have adapted to drink salt water. They can't drink fresh water. They can, but not for long. And I don't, they, I don't think that they survive on, on it. But anyway, they've adapted where they're, they actually have tubes at the tops of their bills and the saline, which is a very thick, salty substance. That's the stuff their body can't use. It comes comes out through the top of their nose and drips down. You can actually see it dripping down. But yeah, they're they're adapted to really um they make their living off of the ocean. Wow. So they only lay one egg. They yep. will take turns feeding it for 65 days. Yep. And and so that the albatross well, that's on it will will like sit on it for two to three weeks and they don't get food and they don't get water? No, no. But the, the hatching time to the fledging time is 165 days. 165. So it's, um, yeah. So it's a, it's a it's bunch half of a year. Yeah, well, not quite, but yeah. Almost yeah. So half they, a year. they actually raise that chick. It's not until the summertime that they, that the chicks finally fledge. So they come and they, they, they start it in, in November. Mm -hmm. And they'll kind of congregate and then they'll start laying their eggs and they won't mm -hmm. leave until summertime. Well, they take the, the adults take turns. Right. Right. So oh, I find that fascinating. Time the time. Yeah. Wow. Um, is there a banding program on Midway? Well, I know they banned a lot of chicks. I mean, so on, I know at, on, on, when at Kilauea Point, I know they were banding all of the albatross that were there because there were so many less of them. But on Midway, I know that they do, they'll do what's called a plot survey. So they'll have a certain area, like a square or a circle. And within that area, they'll band all of the um, albatrosses. So that way they're able to really study them and study them over several years. So they, um, they don't band all of them because we're talking about a million birds <laughs> at a clip on the colony. So, so why, don't we, why don't we play that video, um, Hardy, about the colony? Uh, video number five and then and then i think i'll um move us to the questions about what can we do for them sounds great how, how can we help them Wow. 
I was riding my bike, I should say. So on Midway, you, you ride a bike. That's how you get around. So when I was taking that video, I was actually riding my bike <laughs> to just do a, a, a span. And that was just like one area of Midway. The whole, the, uh, the um, atoll is basically one mile by two miles. And it's everywhere there's a piece of land that's available, there'll be an albatross or available and um, appropriate or, or um, really has the right conditions for nesting. You'll, you'll see somebody nesting there. It's pretty how do you, well. how do you count, the road sometimes. How do you count them when there's so many? Oh, that's a, that's a long story. <laughs> so, so but, someone yeah, did have a question. Oh, did someone ask that question or was that yeah. yours? No, no, okay. someone asked a question. Okay. No, I, if you watch my video, I actually make a, a whole, a, a little movie about it. But basically, you 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 break the all the three different um, islands that are make up the atoll into sectors. So those sectors are areas. And then um, let's say there are six of us in a group of counters. And we stand about um, uh, three albatross nests apart. <laughs> and uh, we have clickers in our hand. And we just walk through. Actually, we have two because it's usually Laysan and Blackfooted. There's a third species called um, Shorttail. And actually, this year they fledged successfully, which is really cool and really exciting because uh, the short tailed albatrosses are, are very rare. They really got decimated back with the feather industry in Victorian times. Um, but yeah, counting them is really amazing. So you go back and forth, and you pinwheel at the end of the line, and um, then go go uh, back and cover the next area. And you just continue until you've counted all the sectors. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. The, the record year that I did in, in um, it was hatch year 2015, we had um, like 666,000 active nests that we counted. It wow. was incredible. I, I guess I mentioned that already. I'm just, I'm still impressed by it. <laughs> so, so that means 1.2, 1.3 million birds. Albatross. Well, thanks for saying that because when I, when we say active nest, so that means it's two adults, right? And an yeah. egg. And then there's all of the juveniles that are coming back and they're prospecting. So <gasps> yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of albatrosses. So oh. it's over a million albatrosses usually at a time in a, in a colony. So let's get down to the, the nitty gritty. What can okay. we do to help them? Chris, Chris okay. says, what is the most important thing we can do to help secure the future success of the albatross species? Wow, that's a great um, question. And I think there's a lot of different things that we can do, but um, I'll just, I'll say the three main threats and how that, and how we can uh, make a difference for them in that regard. The first one would be sea level rise is a big problem for albatrosses, mm -hmm. especially the black footed that nest um, closest to the shore because so energy, we, we can use less energy, which will affect sea level rise. But they, um, I saw it when I was there, a sea surge happens. The ocean is getting higher and higher. And it, it, um, when during storms, you have storm surge and it wipes out nests and, um, it takes away a whole nesting season for an albatross. And eventually these low lying islands, that's the Northwestern Hawaiian islands. They're all very low. They're, they're atolls, just sandy, atolls is what it's what's left over from where a volcano used to be right so just over so much time now it's just this low sandy island and um so anyway using less using less energy so ride your bike you know the usual kind of stuff if you can take public transportation i mean of course we're in an unusual moment right now with the um the virus and everything but just knowing that when you can take take your bike walk just be conscious of your energy consumption, turn off the lights, stuff like that. Um, and then there's long line fisheries. So a lot of albatrosses are attracted to the bait that's on these lines. They, they chase fishing boats. That's the biggest threat for the black footed albatrosses. They just, they're always attracted to the boats. And if they get, if they go after the bait and they get hooked, they can get pulled under and they drown. And there's a ton of, um, there's a ton of losses of albatrosses to long line fisheries. So lately there's um, there's an effort to educate and get and get and um, get the fishing boats to use scaring techniques. And I think it's just really simple. It's like flags and stuff. The albatrosses are afraid and they don't go after the boat. So just just to be very aware when you buy buy um, um, safe 
seafood, uh, albatross safe seafood. I know it doesn't say it, but the long line fisheries is something to, to really key into. That kind of um, fishing technique is very dangerous to albatrosses. And finally, plastic which I started to talk about a little bit before, but we can we can definitely not, we don't have to use single use plastic. I mean, if you have something that's single use, just use it again, keep using it. But it, um, when you wouldn't believe going out to Midway, I mean, what how much plastic you see. So what you guys are doing, Pacific Beach Coalition, I mean, you're, you're going out, you're cleaning up the beaches, you're educating the public about, um, about plastic use and you're also out plant i mean pacific beach coalition goes out and plants plants native um nat native plants and and again teaches people about it so that's I, what what i try to do is i try to teach people through this kind of um this kind of a conversation and also with my artwork and my books so yeah we have to share so, that you know, the trust. So if you have young people, if, if you're a young person or you have young people in your life, uh, I, I worked with Cornell uh, Lab Publishing Group and Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and we published this book. And it's all about um, a, a, the, a day in the life of an albatross. And it's got all the technical good stuff, but it's it's fun. It's a fun story. And um, it's got beautiful photos, beautiful art. And I really go into all of the uh, different specifics about albatross biology, but you can learn it in a fun way. So that's a nice way to kind of reach out to um, to young people. And you can also, I want to hand it over to you, Lynn, to talk about some cool things that you guys are doing. But I just want to remember to say, Friends of Midway Atoll, they actually fund all the work that's done on Midway that, that uh, not all of it, but they they help fund the um, the care of the wildlife out on Midway. And they're an in incredible group. And I love them, and I and I work with them whenever I can, and I donate art for them to use. So they're about to launch a new bonfire campaign that's all about raising funds for um, the Midway wildlife and albatrosses. So if you're interested in a, in a, um, the latest artwork, which, which actually has um, one of my pieces on the on the back, and the front is this this logo. Uh, nice. But anyway, it's the, it's the albatross uh, digging into the water to grab a squid. So it's gonna be a really fun and dynamic piece on the back. So you could go to Friends of Midway, their website. I think it's FOMA. I don't remember the website, but if you just look up Friends of Midway Atoll, you'll find them and you'll find their campaign in the next few days. So shout out to Friends of Midway. Wow. <laughs> I wanna just say that uh, the Pacifica Library bought um, a bunch of these books, I think maybe 200 to give to people for a uh, book to action uh, for this year with Earth Day. So I'm not sure if they're going to keep it for next year or if uh, when things kind of open up, you might get that. Paula, you might um, you might text if you can get on there. Oh, we can share that. But I, I also want to say regarding sea level rise and climate change, plastic pollution um, and drawing the oil out of out of the ground is creating a lot of chemicals that are causing and, and pollutants that are causing sea level rise as well. The climate change. So reducing our use of plastic, and um, I think holding accountable uh, the producers that are selling all this plastic, for them to create a program to minimize the plastic and or to take it back and to reuse it like glass so that it's not in the waste stream, I think that can help uh, sea level rise significantly. And um, they're not gonna do it if we don't ask them to do it or we don't make them do it. So I think our voices are really important. Um, so, so Karen, I, I, I want to thank you so much for all that you have, and we may uh, even fit in another cu couple questions. I see um, a bunch of really great questions here. I feel bad that we didn't get to answer. Is there a way that we can address questions later, or hang or hang on, and um, can we go beyond the hour and ask answer? Hmm, how should we do this? People can, you can, if you go to my website, you can um, just go ahead and email me questions that we didn't get to answer because you have some great questions here. So I feel I would really like to be able to answer them for you. The link will stay active and in that you can answer the questions right there in that ask a question tab. And okay. And we'll continue to watch your video on there as well. Awesome. Oh, so, cool. so, so everybody just know if you asked a question, I will answer it over the next day. So check back on that link. Well, maybe we need to do this again. 
Now we need to have you come back. <laughs> so, so I did. I did want to thank um, you, you so much. You've you've been just a delight to 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 work with, and you you've just you know shared your artwork with us for our Earth Day uh, poster. So we'll probably use this again next year. Um, you've been very generous in um, creating the video for us to learn from and creating the school assembly for us to share with the kids. Um, and you've just delighted us with um, all this information. Um, I also, oh, there, how, how, how beautiful is that? And that's all block print, I understand. Yeah, right? that's right. So it's block printing. And um, you can see it tells the story on, on the right side are the squid. And so this albatross is flying back to feed its chick. So that I want you to tell that whole story of the um, albatross in that moment. And there's the chick on the left. Mm -hmm. And we've got the waves and we've got the wind, right? Yep. Well, I have to say, Lynn, it's been, and, and all of you, thank you so much at Pacific Beach Coalition. It's such a pleasure. And we'll continue to work together. I, I feel like I love, I love working with you guys. It's a great partnership. And so if everything gets back to, if everything gets back to normal, Karen, um, they'll be able to come see you at the EcoFest, hopefully in April. Yeah, great. Right? It'll be good and fun. in the meantime, um, I think we can all dedicate some time to pick up the litter that we have. The Beach Coalition is supporting um, volunteers with a bucket and pick up sticks through our Street to Beach program. We're asking um, everybody that picks up litter to um, log it in the app called Clean Swell. And the Clean Swell app is really easy, but it catalogs what you're picking up and pinpointing it when you when you put submit. And that's, those are all information that we can share and um, use to get legislation changed with all the plastic that we're using. So if you'd like to um, sign up for the Street to Beach program, please look at our website, pacificbeachcoalition.org. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Pacific Beach Coalition members. Um, so many people are doing very good work. Uh, so many volunteers. I mean, we've got about 150 street to beach cleanup people since Memorial Day. So that's people that are dedicated to picking up all the time, whenever they walk and wherever they are. So um, it's the 4th of July coming up next week. Let's make a commitment to use, um, make it a healthy 4th of July and, and no single use plastic, um, no more plastic forks and spoons, no more plastic cups and no more plastic bottles as much as you can. So um, I wanna thank everybody. It looks like we're pretty much out of time. Um, I see a, a thing. Thank you, Karen, for being so engaging. Uh, I'm reading these. I, I want, I'm gonna be able to take my time and, and read them and I'm gonna answer all your questions. So please check back because there are some great questions here and I'm like, ah, chomping at the bit. I wanna um, answer them. So there's a lot of cool, a lot of cool things about albatross that you're, I mean, really great questions. Thanks so much for your interest, everybody. And yay, <laughs> yay albatrosses. You got it. Thanks and we got the educational guide down below too, where you, people um, that are educators, right. or even if you have kids at home, you can yep. pull up some lessons. Right. That are Cornell, done with lab. Cornell Lab, excuse me for interrupting. Cornell Lab of Ornithology created an educational guide to go with, with the book. And uh, it's, you can download it for free and it's, fabulous and it even um, uses it goes according to the standards the national standards so you can use it for stem and uh, it's incredible and it's a beautiful resource for for educators and for parents and and there's even on their website they have different activities that you can do so there's a lot there go to the Cornell lab website and if you want to learn more about volunteering go to the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service website midway and you can learn about volunteer opportunities there. I'd also like to give a big shout out to um, Hardy from Earth Capades. Yeah, um, I think we gave him a few gray hairs making this happen. And Hardy and his wife listen, and his son um, they, Kai have been juggling and um, teaching people about the environment and education um, and water, and they're just incredible Earth heroes. So thank you, Hardy and Earth Capades. Thank you, Hardy. Yay! Yay! There there they are. Hardy <laughs> Aww. And thanks to everybody else on the Pacific Beach Coalition team to make this happen. You guys are awesome. So happy to know you. Wonderful. Okay, thanks guys. everybody for watching and hanging in there. I see we didn't lose. Everybody stayed the whole time. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 180 people. Wow. <laughs> wonderful.
Yay! So uh, aloha from Volcano Hawaii. Ahui ho. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great bye night, bye. everybody. Okay, bye bye now. Bye bye. Wow.